Our next speaker, his name is Daniel DiMartino. Some of you might know him. He is an economics major here, um, and he's going to talk to us about populism in the 21st century. I don't even, I can't even begin to explain what that means, so I'm going to let him do it. Everyone, round of applause for Daniel. How fortunate for governments that the people they administer don't think. Sadly, this quote is, in most of the cases, true. And even more importantly, this quote was pronounced by Adolf, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler is one of the most famous populists and one of the most successful populists in his pursuits. And it's part of what I want to talk to you about today. Populism in the 21st century. This is an issue that we should all care about because it deeply affects our lives and it has consequences for people all over the world. And it's also something we can do something about. Populism is something that affects, that has affected me because I come from a country, Venezuela, which 20 years ago was just an average democracy in Latin America. And today it's one of the most totalitarian states in the world next to North Korea, Cuba, perhaps even worse than countries like China. However, this is not the only experience I have with populism. This is an issue that I have researched a lot about. There are scholars at Harvard, such as Noam Riedel and Mark Bonikowski, who have extensively done research on what is populism, how this affects us, and of course, what are its consequences. And this is, together with uh, my experience, what I'm going to tell you about today. So populism is defined by the Encyclopedia Britannica as any political movement or political party or person that champions a common person and contrasts that favorably against an elite. By this definition, mainly every politician is a populist. However, according to Noam Gidger and Barbara Nikowski from Harvard University, populism can be defined as three different things. First, it can be defined as an ideology as a discursive style, or as a political strategy. If we define populism as an ideology, it's any kind of idea or set of ideas, system of beliefs, that divides the population in two chunks of people. The people and those against the people. The people are the common man, the working class, the American people, the workers. Well, the anti-people are the establishment, like you've heard a lot, the news media, the elite, the billionaires, the politicians, everyone who we hate. Is the, it's, it's basically everyone who we hate. And this is why this is a collectivist kind of ideology. Collectivism means that they strip away our individuality in, or, in, order, in order to put us in teams so that we, even if we are being damaged by these kinds of policies and ideas, we have loyalty to our team and therefore unwavering support for the populist person. But populism is also a discursive style, and that's why there's also people that are called populist, even if they don't have populist agendas or populist ideas. Populist, according to Gabriela Al Gloria Alvarez, she's a political science for, scientist from Guatemala, is a person who, first of all, portrays him or herself as the savior of the people, kind of Jesus Christ or you know God on earth. This person does pronounces statements such as, "I am the only one who knows how this works. I am the only one who knows how this is can, this can be fixed. I am the only one who knows the system. I am the only one who can uh, solve the problems of the people today." Also, the populist promotes division. There are different kinds of division. They can divide us either by race, they can divide us by income, they can divide us by nationality, absolutely everything, gender. But this is done by the populists, like I told you before, to exacerbate collectivism so that even if we are damaged by these policies, we will always vote for the populist because he's on our team and we're against the elite, you know. We can't support the elite. The populist also establishes unrealistic goals. Goals that are really subjective, impossible to achieve, and he can always fight and advance forward. This is in order to grab more power and ultimately um, stay in power forever. Fortunately for us, people die, and that's why they can't stay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ultimately, the populist 
capitalist grasps power and and tries to um, centralize the government this way. The goal, the populist style. I'm going to do it without the mic. The mic. power and in this way it's this the goals that the populist establishes can be accomplished according to his or her beliefs. As you might know this uh, the person that's pictured here is Nigel Farage. He was he's a famous populist by according to many political scientists because he was one of the leaders of the Brexit movement in the United Kingdom and he as you can see, in the populist, populist in general always use exacerbating gestures with their hands, their voices, or their, or their faces. But the populist gets to a point that because of the division that he or she creates in society, we will support him or her whatever he or she says. And this can be exemplified by the late Hugo Chavez, the dictator of Venezuela until 2013 when he died, when he said, it doesn't matter if we are naked or if we don't have enough to eat. This is about saving the revolution. What is saving the revolution, I ask you? <laughs> it's anything. Today, Venezuelans are naked and don't have anything to eat, and they save the revolution. If that's saving the revolution, I don't care about the revolution. I care about having something to eat and, ha and having clothing. <laughs> the populist <laughs> always tries to establish a cult of personality. In this picture, you can see the Cuban army holding pictures of Fidel Castro after he died. Everyone holding the same picture, of course, given by the government. It's not possible to coordinate millions of people to hold the same picture at the same time. And it gets into the brains of people either by brainwashing or just simply by com complete annihilation of political opposition. Now, I know that you must all be thinking about politicians in the United States, and that's why you're interested in this talk, I know it. But to talk about the United States and to talk about examples in the real world all over the, the planet, we need to see what types of populism exist. Not all populists are created equal, right? <laughs> there are three main types of populism. There's right-wing populism, based, uh, we have an example here in the top, which is Marine Le Pen, the leader of the National Front in France. This populism is based on xenophobic policies, try to, tries to divide the population by race, by national origin, by religion. In the West, this is done to eliminate, well, not eliminate, that would be uh, much more like uh, fascism in this case, but try to get away of excluding people like Muslims, people uh, that think differently, or just people with racial minorities. However, this is not a unique phenomenon in the West, and right-wing populism is not something that only happens in Europe and the United States. Countries like Indonesia, which is the country with more mo mo most Muslims in the world, currently elected a president who wants to discriminate against Christians, and it's exactly the same right-wing populism, just that the roles are inverted between Christians and Muslims. There's left-wing populism. In this case, they try to divide us by class, the poor against the rich. If there's enough poor people in the country, they just use the poor. If not, they add, they add the middle class so that they can have a majority of the people. The left-wing populism is exemplified by people such as Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, but also people like Pablo Iglesias in Spain that are actually funded by the Venezuelan government to promote these kind of terrible policies in other countries. Left-wing populists try to divide the population by class in order to promote a sentiment of class warfare just like Marxist ideas. This Ideas that might seem with good intentions in many times end up, end up in results such as the Venezuelan catastrophe, Cuba, the USSR, China, where people don't have freedom because you can't take away people's property by peacefully. It's just impossible. Just like you can't deport people and you can't get away with eliminating freedom of speech and freedom of religion peacefully. And there's also Big Ten populism. Big Ten populism takes away ideas from everywhere in the political spectrum and tries to be apolitical. 
against only against the elite, the, the establishment, and not connected to any political party. I'm independent. The most recent example of this is an actually successful one because he got elected is Rodrigo Duterte, the president of the Philippines, who ran a campaign based on attacking crime. His way of attacking crime is riding motorcycles in the streets, killing people. Himself. Self admitted. Big Ten populism, therefore, is just a classical division between the population and the elite. The problem with this definition of the population and the elite is that the populist can just define anyone as the elite and exclude them from the favor of the rest of the population. Now, how, who is a populist in the United States? <coughs> who thinks here that Donald Trump is a populist? Raise your hands. Who thinks Bernie Sanders is a populist? Okay. We can't, because I'm not a scholar, neither are most of you, I think, unless someone's <laughs> here a scholar, please tell me, uh, because it would be really helpful, of course, whether these people are populist. What we know is that they have a populist discursive style. It's, that's, of course, something that there's no discussion about. Both use their hands, their voices, in ways that populists all over the world do, and they have ideas of right-wing and left-wing populism, respectively. Now, do you think that Hillary Clinton is a populist? Who thinks Hillary Clinton is a populist? Okay, that's fine. Now, she's definitely not a populist such as Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. However, not having a populist discursive style doesn't make you just a normal politician or just because you are defined as the establishment by the populists doesn't mean that you're not actually someone who proposes populist ideas. Both Hillary Clinton, oh, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, and Donald Trump have populist ideas. Anyone who tries to attack a specific minority group in any society just to benefit a larger majority, basically a dictatorship of the majority, is in essence trying to coalesce support around that person. That person is the only one who knows the system, that person is the only one who can fix it, and that's why it can also be a, a populist characteristic, although that person is not a populist in or herself. But what about the rest of the world? Who are other populists and examples all over the world? There are pop there's both right-wing and populist governments all over the world. The first example we have here is Argentina, which uh, her former, the former president of Argentina, Cristina Fernandez, she was uh, president after her husband, the president of Argentina, died, and she got elected because the president named her um, her successor, his successor, basically. And thankfully, Argentina had strong enough institutions that after a long time, decades ruling the country, she was able to be ousted in a democratic election. However, this is not always the case. <coughs> Venezuela had the same case at the same time, just that we started earlier, Argentina was able to see what was the path of Venezuela and what was the path of Argentina was the Argentina was following Venezuela and they just changed. But Venezuela is still in the in the same populist dictatorship and we don't have free elections anymore. And this is the main reason we call it. Russia on the other hand is a right wing populist dictatorship we could say. Although it's not classified officially as a dictatorship because they still have elections. Well no, there's no country on earth except Saudi Arabia and the Vatican, perhaps, that say that they're not democratic official. Every other country thinks that they're democratic. North Korea says they're democratic. <laughs> and in Cuba, they have elections. One party elections and only one candidate. And everyone has to vote. <laughs> Russia is a country that allows for the killing of uh, L the LGBTQ community in the south of the country. It's a country in which the Jehovah Witnesses religion was classified as a terrorist organization. One of the most peaceful religions in the world was completely banned in the country just because they are terrorists. And they're Christians. <laughs> and the construction of um, any kind of religious or worship places for non-Orthodox Christian religions was banned. Turkey, on the other hand, is also a country that's following the same path of undemocratic right-wing politics with the president Recep Tayyip Erdogan trying to ban Twitter, trying to ban any kind of social media discriminated against uh, ethnic, ethnic minority groups such as the Kurds and killing them with the excuse that they are killing ISIS when they're actually 
throwing bombs inside the little country. But the worst thing about populism is not just that people speak and you know they're trying to lie to us, they deceive us to get and stay in power, because if at least they were good governments, you know, it wouldn't be such a bad issue. But the truth is that the consequences of populism are inescapable for all of us. And no one is safe from a populist government. Thankfully, the United States has not had successful populist government ever in history or otherwise the United States wouldn't be a democracy. We wouldn't be able to meet here and talk about it if this was not a democracy with free speech and all the rights that are included with it. But I can tell you from my personal experience that the consequences of populism are not pretty and that's why we need to avoid it. Venezuela was the richest country in Latin America, well, actually the richest country in the Americas after the United States in the 1950s. Today it's as poor as Haiti. Although we don't have natural disasters, we don't have earthquakes, we don't have tornadoes, we don't have any kind of natural disaster. It's among the best climates, the best weathers in the world. And people are basically eating from the streets. There's shortages of goods and services everywhere because the government thinks that inflation is something that comes from our minds. It's a psychological phenomenon. And the solution is controlling prices and lowering them by force or just taking away your property. Because, of course, businessmen don't want to sell things and earn money. That's why there's nothing in the supermarkets. They hate earning money, the businessmen. <laughs> and people end up in the streets and even killing animals to eat. Thankfully, I am here with you in the United States, but this is something that still many people are suffering in where I am from and in countries like Russia where there's even the, it's, this is not only like for left-wing populist regimes, in Russia there's also a terrible economic situation. This picture you, you can see here to the left, is I actually took it myself. This is Venezuelan currency and all that money that you see there, I, I'm not rich, that's, that's less than $10 in, and it's perhaps less while we're speaking because of the high rate of inflation and the very fast um, increase in the exchange rate. So this is, if you, if you think that this is $10, you can understand why these people are here in the streets in this picture. Because it's, it's, it's a consequence of populism. But what we need to remember from this is that populism can only rise in democracies. Populism is the phenomenon, like I told you in the beginning, that champions the common person in contrast with an elite. But this is all done just to get our wavering support for a leader who doesn't actually have good intentions for us, but only has the intention to stay in power, get rich, and stay there forever. Populism can only rise in democracies, because if it was a dictatorship, they wouldn't need our support or vote for it. Vladimir Putin got elected democratically the first time. Hugo Chavez got elected the first time. Rodrigo Duterte got elected. In Argentina, they got him elected. If we really want to stop populism, we have to stop voting for it.